Hi, Adam here. A quick warning before we start, this series contains adult themes and this episode in particular has some strong language. Gone Fishing, part three. Good Westie, bad Westie. So then to the left would be the house and then there was a garage that went down underneath the house where the um, dining area was, just a little single car garage. So you go up the back stairs and there was a porch. Gail Maney is talking about 22 Larnock Road, the house in Henderson, West Auckland, where she lived for the two years from late 1988 to late 1990. It's the house where she lived with her partner David McGalley and their young child. There are photos taken inside Larnock Road of Gail's daughter posing on a tricycle and of a Christmas tree surrounded by presents. But as a jury would later learn, the house at Larnock Road was also a place where you'd find hard drugs and dealers who were even harder. It was a place where burglars felt they could store their stolen goods. It was home to sex workers and strip club bouncers and random people who'd sleep on the couch for a while. It was a place of obnoxiously loud parties, all-day drinking sessions and fist fights in the living room. It was the house that, almost a decade later, police would identify as the focal point of the murder of Dean Fuller Sands. Gail Maney doesn't deny that during her time at Larnock Road, her life took a dramatic turn for the worse. But she says the important thing is to look at the timing. By the police's account, her shift from quiet suburban mom to underworld figure happened just in time for her to be responsible for Dean's death. They say she decided Dean had stolen some of her drugs, so she asked Stephen Stone, a strip club bouncer she'd only just met, to kill Dean. Gail says that police timeline is wrong in a variety of ways. She says she and a private detective managed to reconstruct the calendar of her life back at Larnock Road. And yes, she certainly did go off the rails. She became a drug user and a prostitute and fell in with a bad crowd. But that didn't happen till later than the police would have you believe. Gail Maney says her journey from good Westie to bad Westie didn't happen until after Dean Fuller-Sands was already dead. From Stuff and RNZ, this is Gone Fishing, a podcast by Amy Maas and me, Adam Dudding. In the late 19th century, on the edge of the tiny West Auckland settlement of Henderson, a gum digger's camp sprang up. It was run by a Portuguese immigrant called Don Buck, real name Francisco Rodriguez Figueira. Don Buck was a mythic cowboy kind of figure. He carried a gun and rode a horse and always wore high leather boots. His gum diggers were a rough bunch. Many were down and outs. Local farmers complained that the camp was the scene of riotous drunkenness and loose morals, but Don Buck was apparently firm but fair and kept things under control. The magistrate's court in Auckland was so impressed with him that they made a special arrangement. City vagrants who were facing minor jail sentences would instead be assigned to Don Buck's camp, where they'd receive food, shelter and a chance to earn a little money digging for kauri gum. Once a fortnight, Don Buck would pick up the latest bunch of ne'er wells from the court and take them to the Henderson camp. It's been said that some of the shady aura that still clings to West Auckland dates all the way back to those days when the folk who were too rough around the edges for central Auckland were sent west. Perhaps it's true. Perhaps it's not. But either way, I, I think it's kind of telling that in West Auckland there's a major road, a park and a primary school all named after their ambiguous local hero, Don Buck. Today, if you climb up somewhere high in central Auckland and look west, you can't miss the rugged, dark green hills of the Waitakere Ranges. Halfway to those hills is where you'll find West Auckland. It's a cluster of blue-collar suburbs roughly bounded by Massey to the north and Glen Eden to the south, by Henderson Valley to the west and Newland to the east. And Henderson, where Gail Maney lived in 1989, is bang in the middle. Grow up in one of these suburbs and you can legitimately call yourself a Westie. But as Auckland house prices rise, the Westie suburbs are gentrifying. 
and so is the label. The TV comedy Outrageous Fortune introduced New Zealand to an idealised family of Westies, roguish scrappers who get in trouble with the law but have hearts of gold. Our deputy opposition leader, a woman called Paula Bennett, is a Westie. These days she's on a nice parliamentary salary, but she still plays up her battling, working-class Westiness for political gain. Sometimes it feels like the word is getting a bit too cute. But out in the real world, places like Henderson, Kelston and Ranui are holding the line. Here, the word Westie still means black t-shirts and crushed purple velvet, panel beaters and tyre shops, Ford versus Holden, classic rock and heavy metal, and big parties. They would have like bands at a hall, like Tirangi Hall or Carrie Lands Hall, and then half of West Auckland's there, and everyone's tripping out on LSD and head banging, and it's a really good night. And then the police might come to shut the hall down, and then or there could end up being a big brawl, and everyone goes their different ways, or and then meets up at the next point. So those kind of parties were like really good nights because you like totally smashed. I'll probably get home like about four or five in the morning, you know, so you go to the next address or this house or whatever and there's a party there. So everyone that's just been at this hall or whatever, gig, you go to the next place and um, carry on partying and having a good night. Normally I'd probably have like my long knee-high boots on, black tights, um, black mini skirt, leather vest, a top or leather jacket, heaps of like chunky rings. Yeah, just kind of like the whole sort of Westy look. And what, what was your hair like then? It was like a mullet, kind of, you know, layered Westy kind of look. That fear of faucet kind of like look. <laughs> Gail's talking about the late 80s, early 90s. But to understand the making of this particular Westy, you need to rewind a little bit further to her childhood. We were quite poor. We didn't have like, you know, a lot clothing and stuff like that. There was never any like food in the cupboards. Um, yeah, so there's domestic violence and then drinking and, you know, we'd go in the car and mum and dad would be somewhere getting drunk or doing whatever or us kids are waiting in the car. And so we sort of grew up in that kind of scene. Um, my dad was always a mechanic and then mum normally did like factory kind of work. And she did do out working from home with sewing and that for a while. I was quite a high achiever at school. I went through a little bit of a rebellious stage at high school, but then by then I sort of stopped being like that. She went to Calston Girls School, but... I left just before I set my school C, much to my father was very annoyed at me. <laughs> and why did you do that? Because I wanted some money to go and buy myself some clothing and things like that. So um, I left to go on a benefit. But that was only about $48 then, and I think not long after I left I got a, part, a job. School Lever Gale doesn't consider aiming higher. Despite her obvious intelligence, it doesn't occur to her that she might aspire to a challenging job or that she's bright enough to earn some proper qualifications. She'll only figure that out decades later, in prison, where she'll earn a Bachelor of Applied Sciences majoring in psychology. Um, I think I met David around about 1983, maybe the same year I left school possibly. Yeah, so I was with him from when I was 16 till I was 22. Gail and David McGalley have been together three years when Gail gets pregnant. She has her daughter on the day before her 20th birthday. We were both pot smokers. So that was kind of about it, That all that we did, and we both worked full time, and we had a group of friends around us that we all kind of led the same sort of lifestyles and everyone kind of had it together. But it wasn't a, like a bad scene or anything like that, and then most of us girls all ended up pregnant at the same time. and So we kind of were doing like the mummy things and the relationship things. And They're not exactly squeaky clean, but... Like, didn't have anything that was going to bring the police to our address or... Yeah, if anything, says Gail, her life during these years is a little bit boring, a little weird while playing cards with friends, almost no drinking to speak of, no involvement with prostitution or hard drugs, no gang connections, no violence. She and David are into motorbikes, and some of the friends they make through that scene are great people. People like Billy and Brett. Hi, Brett, it's Amy again from Radio New Zealand. How are you doing? Good. 
Um, did you manage to have a chat with Billy? Yeah, no, well, I've been talking to her about it. Um, like I said, she had a brain injury about six and a half years ago, so I'll have to be sort of your interpreter. Billy and Brett Murray met Gail in the early 1980s when they were all teenagers. It probably me that was doing... Yeah, it's probably Billy more yeah. than... But, you know, Gail, Gail's idea of We went to see Billy and Brett at their home in rural Waikato. Brett runs an orchard, and before her stroke, Billy was a counsellor. As Brett said on the phone, the brain injury makes it hard for Billy to speak. But there's nothing wrong with her memory. It's just that she can't always find the words. Names are especially difficult. So before we arrive, Brett covers a sheet of A4 paper with the names of everyone Billy might want to talk about so she can point at them. Billy has really vivid memories of the time she met Mark Franklin during Gail's trial. Because I knew how bad he was. I knew he was a fucking dick. Well, I didn't know he was. The whole he was horrible. Yeah, but he wasn't... He's going he was on the radio. Really, we can't swear on the radio. Yeah, well, he was horrible anyway. It's okay, you can swear on our radio. <laughs> <laughs> 30 years on, Billy and Brett are still among Gail's best friends and supporters. We figured we might hear a rather rose-tinted account of Gail's past from them. But although Billy and Brett are totally convinced of her innocence, and they've got some pretty good arguments in support of that, they are also very open about the darker side of Gail Maney. They saw how she changed for the worse in her early 20s. The point for them isn't that Gail is innocent because she's some kind of paragon of virtue. The point is that she's innocent despite her many flaws. Billy used to be a counsellor for child abuse and everything yeah. else all it before her accident for 30 odd years, you know what I mean? So we had all the wayward strays and everything living with us. That's been Billy's role all her life. And Gail was probably one of her best cases as far as she was concerned. She kept you busy, didn't she? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Billy and Brett meet Gail Manny and David McGalley because they're all part of a scene who hang out in Derby Street, just off Queen Street in central Auckland. <laughs> We were a, a group of, say, up to 100 motorbikes with one or two passengers on each one. And, yeah, we used to ride all around sort of Puhoi, yeah. up north, down south, you know, to the Red Fox Tavern for the afternoon and, and back again. And, you know, just as a group of people trying to not be misfits, but sort of, you know, have a bit of fun along the way. Um, I had a Norton 750 chopper I used to take into town. There was an all sorts from a 125 Suzuki to a back then a yeah. GSXR 1100 was the biggest bike you could buy then. We used to smoke a bit of pot and everything, you know, you know, do a bit of stupid things on motorbikes, wheel standing yeah. everywhere up and yeah. down the streets, you know. Yeah. We were more into mischief than trouble, you know, it yeah. wasn't, um, there was no maliciousness behind any of it or, you know, it was just, we were trying to keep ourselves out of trouble, yeah. but have a good time at the same time. When they first meet Gail, Billy and Brett think she's lovely, friendly and fun. She's no toughie like she makes out. She might have a rough looking exterior to some people, but most of us that know her know that she's really, she hasn't got too many nasty bones in that body of hers, if you know what I mean. When they meet, she wears a lot of pink. She doesn't seem especially rebellious. Gail and Dave were one of the, the straighter peer yeah. Of, of, of the group, they were just a nice couple and we got to yeah. know them quite well. And One evening, around 1986, Gail does something that really makes an impression on Brett. One night at the Auckland Museum, we were all parked up there, probably about 100 motorbikes, and we had these drunk dudes turn up in a car and they were harassing Gail and David and a couple of others and... One of them got out and kicked David's bike over and then they jumped back in the car and took off. So me and a, another friend of mine went in hot pursuit because we were on trail bikes. So 
So we chase these guys around and around the, the top flight of the um, museum and sort of trying to get them to stop the car and everything else. And, and I just about got the car to stop when the guy decided he would just bowl me straight off my bike, stick me <laughs> under his car and carry on, get, dragging me down the road until I popped out the other side. Well, everyone then got up in arms and started, right, we're going to get these guys before they leave. The, and it was actually Gail that stood up and went, hold on, hold on, hold on. It was our bike that got damaged. We're not going to hurt someone because of all of this. And you guys are just getting out of hand. She ended up saying to these guys, I would just leave if, quietly if I was you. And next time you see a bunch of motorbikes like this, you probably isn't a good idea to do what you just done. Gail actually saved four guys from being pummeled that night. Gail was actually the one who stopped all of us just losing it and chasing these guys that night. She's also got the insight to go, this could get out of hand really fast. So we don't really want to go there, guys, or we're all going to jail for it. There's plenty of incidences where Gail stepped in and goes, it's probably not the best idea, you guys. Think before you act. You know, so she used to be quite a rational person. Billy and Gail become even closer when Gail gets pregnant with Colleen. Billy and Brett are Colleen's godparents. For the little girl's first birthday, the two couples spent eight hours building a huge birthday cake. Yeah, me, Gail, Billy and, and David had to, you know, yeah. um, build this massive princess castle and everything else out of cake. The cake is two metres tall and even has a drawbridge. Gail was and is a good person, Brett says. I've never seen any of what's been portrayed in the media about Gail being a, this monster that can order hits and everything else. I mean, it's just not, that's not in here. April 1989. If you're keeping track of the dates, this is about four months before Dean Fuller Sands goes missing. The two couples, Billy and Brett, Gail and David, have been close for about five years, but Billy and Brett are sick of Auckland. They moved to Waihi, a laid-back spot on the Coromandel Peninsula, a few hours south, but stay closely in touch. By now, Gail and David and their daughter have been living at Larnock Road in Henderson for about six months. But the relationship is souring, and in June, David moves out. An old school friend moves in, then moves on six weeks later. Gail's little brother Colin comes to stay after an argument with his dad and sleeps on the couch. Gail advertises for a new flatmate, but the woman who answers the ad doesn't take the room. And then, Gail's old friend Tanya Wilson drops by. It's all too convenient. She's looking for somewhere to stay and moves into the spare room at Larnock Road. Gail hasn't seen much of Tanya in recent years. Tanya's been moving in much rougher circles. She's taking heavier drugs and drinking a lot. She's working as a prostitute in Karangahapi Road parlours. She has connections with gang members and career criminals. From where Gail's sitting, it all sounds kind of great. I thought her life seemed quite exciting from my boring life of being with the same partner for the past six years and the stay-at-home mum. And, um, so, and she seemed to go out and party and get wasted and that seemed appealing. So I asked her about working in the parlours and what it was like and I thought that you know, it would be nice to have some extra money. Tanya explained to me what would happen in the parlours and she gave me some drugs to take, some benzodiazepines, prescription medication, which she said would help me. Um, so we went to the mess up, we went to the first place we worked at was um, the Japanese bathhouse on Upper Queen Street and that's when I met Stephen Stone was there working as a doorman with um, Mark Hendrickson and sort of like over the night we sort of talked to them and then the, probably over the next week we got to know them a bit better. Me and Tanya thought that he was quite cute and because he was very like charismatic to women and so we ended up taking him home for a threesome when we were quite drunk and wasted and um, and then Tanya kept sleeping with him for maybe over the next three or four weeks because we only actually knew him for about four weeks and he was um, doing burglaries and things like that and storing the stuff in my garage. This was actually quite a cool time for you wasn't it? It felt like it was. For me, yeah, I felt like it was exciting, like, um, just <clears throat> because I guess I never really went into that party kind of lifestyle when I was 16, or I didn't do that, so I almost like I missed out, but just going out, like doing a bit of clubbing, and um, I felt like my life was interesting, and it was kind of seemed appealing, but 
actually it was like really when I think back it was like such silly mis- you know the lifestyle that Tanya lived and the people she associated with were actually not really good people they weren't good influences um, or good decisions um, but I just kind of went with it but sometimes with in, inside myself I kind of knew that things weren't right but I still just carried on like that This, then, is the moment when Gail's life shifts. Later, the exact timing of that shift will become hugely important, but what isn't in dispute is that by late 1989, Gail's life is a mess. She's developed a taste for drugs. Mostly benzodiazepams, which would have been like Serapax, oh, the Rolhypnols. Um, I don't know if people can get those anymore so much anymore. Um, what else do we take? LSD... Um, I think I tried home bake, um, but I'm actually, luckily, I'm scared of needles, so that sort of didn't go very far with me. If you're not an aficionado of New Zealand DIY drugs, a quick word about home bake. It's a kind of homemade heroin cooked up from a base of pharmacy drugs such as codeine. Drugs cost a bit, but there's enough money around. I was on a domestic purposes benefit, and then I was working in the parlours. But I wasn't, when I was in the parlours, we weren't working every week and every day or anything like that. There was periods over that sort of like 15 month period where we wouldn't go to work for like for weeks, you know. Um, some parlours will say you can't come back there anymore because you've been too wasted. Um, and Tanya had a, quite a reputation in some of the massage parlours, so she wasn't allowed to work there. Getting too many drugs, rolling the clients. Quite simply, at this point in her life, Gail Maney isn't a very nice person. I was quite aggressive. We were, we'd get quite wasted and then we wouldn't really take any shit from anybody. So we'd end up, if someone gave us a hard time of guys, we were like being assholes to us. You know, we'd get into a quite, hip, easily get into a fight, physical fight, me, Tanya and you know, like most, most often if we had a fight, it would be with guys or we'd be, you know, we weren't shy to say to someone to where to go or whatever. I guess, you know, with the drugs and things like that, that just sort of gives you that sort of like confidence. That beeped name is the person we're calling Sonia. Her real name is suppressed. Anyway, Billy and Brett are really concerned by the sudden changes they see in their old friend. After about three months after David left, we went to visit Gail and Tanya and them were in the house and they were partying up at 11 o'clock in the morning and you know what I mean. Brett didn't see all that much in the way of drugs actually. It was more booze. All the time there was a bottle of wine ready to go and the girls were quite easy to... And now it's been here for a while. And they're worried about their goddaughter, Carleen. They don't want to judge Gail, but... But we just didn't yeah. think it was the right situation for our little Carleen to be in. Going, and salmon, remember? Yeah. But they were, you know, they were, her and the girls yeah. were having a good time all day. But I day. had my what, girl what, what coming that? with us. What you can't make out purely by listening to the tape is that Billy is miming the words she can't find. What she's telling us is that when she and Brett visit Larnock Road that day, Gail is not only drunk, but she's doing a strip tease. Billy and Brett take Carlene to stay with them in Waihe for a little while, at least until Gail sorts herself out. After a few months, Gail says she wants her daughter back in Auckland. Billy and Brett aren't happy, but they do it anyway. So I took her daughter home, and at the same time I spoke to a few of the gang members that were in the house and politely told them that if anything was to happen to this child, that they, they wouldn't want to be in the house anymore, basically. By the end of 1990, Gail has moved from Larnock Road to a new address and has a new partner. But her life in Auckland is still pretty crazy. Billy and Brett suggest she leave the big city altogether and move to Waihe to be near them. Life might not be quite as exciting down there, but it's a lot more sane. Gail and her new partner, Chris Martin, agree. Gail is pregnant with her second child, so it seems a good time to straighten up. It's been a year and a bit since she went off the rails. In that short time, she's had repeated run-ins with the law. She now has convictions for driving drunk, driving while disqualified, shoplifting, prostitution, breaches of periodic detention, disorderly behaviour. But once she's in Waihe, she straightens up a little. Well, a little. Brett says the problem with Gail and her new partner, Chris, was that... They should never have drunk together. You know, yeah. it was just like getting um, a hammer and a nail because every time you gave them, they both got yeah. drunk together, you knew someone was, you know, they're, they're both picky. 
One's a Capricorn, one's a Taurus, and Gail won't let things go. You know, that's her worst trait. She won't let things go. And it gets to the point where they would bicker and bicker. But, and then, yeah, it would go too far. And before you know it, Gail would have done something silly, like picked up a Jim Beam bottle and clocked Chris off the rack of the head, you know, just to say, shut up, I'm over it. But then, yeah, then it... Like I said, you think back and go, you probably shouldn't have picked up a bottle, Gail, and cracked them on the head with it. But knowing Gail and, you know, like the torment that probably happened leading up to it, you know, it's not, Chris was never an angel either. In Waihi, Gail gives birth to her second child, but then she and Chris split, she returns to Auckland and returns to drugs and prostitution for a few months. After that, says Gail, there are a few years that genuinely are a lot quieter. She has a job at an auto parts company, she finds a new partner, and after a few years, they have a son together. But by 1995, things are getting messy again. There's domestic violence, child, youth and family get involved, Gail starts taking pills again. By the time the police turn up at her flat, one day in 1997, wanting to talk about a body and a boot, she's deep in addiction. I was taking actually up to about 120 pills a day. So um, what happens is that you build a, um, I've been taking them over time, so it was like a cocktail of Halcyum, Serapax, Valiums, Deloxines. Um, so now I realise in my life that if, maybe if I didn't get charged with murder, maybe in a couple more months, it, it actually builds up in your system. And so I probably would have OD, naturally OD'd, um, but I didn't kind of, I just couldn't see what was going on. My life was, my world was just a blur. Eventually, Gail Maney will stand in the dock at the High Court in Auckland, charged with murder. And quite understandably, the prosecution will make a big deal of her character. Whether or not she called for a hit on Dean Fuller Sands, they'll be able to present plenty of evidence that for much of the 1990s, Gail Maney was antisocial, hedonistic, selfish, vengeful, and intermittently violent. She drank a lot, took a lot of drugs, and repeatedly broke the law, albeit on relatively minor charges at this point. Her old friend Tanya will tell the jury how Gail would seek people out if they pissed her off. Chasing people and dragging them out of their cars, pulling hair and smacking them, punching them. Chris Martin, that partner who moved to Waihi with Gail, will also be invited to reminisce in court. He'll talk about the time he watched Tanya and Gail attack a guy in the Westwood Ho Tavern. Chris will say that Gail, quote, got up and hit quite a large guy over the head with an empty beer handle. And that, quote, her and Tanya then attacked him with fists. Chris will also confirm that story from Brett about Gail clocking him with an empty Jim Beam bottle. He'll say it cut his forehead open and left a two centimetre scar that's still visible. Of course character matters, and it seems impossible that this stuff wouldn't leave an impression on a jury. What's interesting though is that Gail doesn't deny any of it. That's part of what makes her so believable. She feels bad about her past. In her diaries, she sometimes wonders if being charged for a murder she didn't commit is some sort of karmic punishment for the bad things she did do. She still beats herself up for having been a bad mother, especially during those wild 15 months at Larnock Road. My daughter, I guess, Carleen, she was two when I left her dad and then she was still living with me and my lifestyle was probably more important, so I was sort of more interested in trying to palm her off wherever I could and... Um, and that just wasn't okay, really. So she was sort of like suffering because of that. And I was exposing her to things that she shouldn't have been seeing. When we're all like high on pills and things like that and drinking and just, it just it's not okay. It wasn't okay for my kids to see that. But when it comes to the fate of Dean Fuller Sands, you could argue that Gail's bad character is beside the point. What matters are the facts and the timing. I'm not saying I'm an angel or anything like that. You know, I've done things wrong in my life and things I regret, but never been involved or in a murder or have any knowledge of a murder or, you know. In the months between her arrest and the depositions hearing, Gail is busy. She wants to prove that what the police are saying can't be true. If the police have their timeline right, she needs to have done all of the following things before Dean went missing on the 21st of August, 1989.
abandon her respectable life as a suburban mom and become a drug-using prostitute. Meet the strip club bouncer, Stephen Stone. Talk to her neighbour, Catherine Sow, who's seen a burglary. Argue in public with Dean Felicence because she thinks he's the burglar. And ask Stephen Stone to kill Dean. But remember, as we explained in the previous episode, Gail is certain the burglary of weed and leathers witnessed by Catherine Sow actually happened 10 months later than the police say. She links her timing to a date in May 1990 when her toddler ended up in hospital after consuming a babysitter's drugs. And beyond that, Gail is certain that her slide from respectable good Westie to hard living bad Westie didn't even begin until September 1989, several weeks after Dean went missing. With the help of the private investigator John Bradley, who we met in part two, Gail tries to prove this timeline. Bradley is the guy who found the electrical and drainage documents which showed that the house next door to Gales in Larnock Road wasn't even habitable in August 1989. Remember, the power hadn't been hooked up, there was no connection to a sewer. Those documents are a serious challenge to the idea that Gales' neighbour, Catherine Sahl, saw the burglary at Gales' house before Dean's death in August. Bradley also tracked down several other documents that helped support Gales' claim that she didn't go off the rails until after Dean disappeared. It gets quite fiddly, but here are some of the dates that Gail and Bradley managed to pin down. So remember that after Gail split from her partner David, she had a flatmate move in for six weeks and then move on? Well, Bradley has proved that this flatmate moved out on the 5th of August because he found a dated rental contract for the moving van. Gail can prove that she started looking for a new flatmate on the 8th of August because that's the date on a trade and exchange classified ad which John Bradley tracked down. With the advertisement date locked in on the 8th, Gail is sure that Tanya Wilson was invited to move into Larnock Road on the 13th and actually arrived with all her stuff on the 17th. Gail says it wasn't until several weeks later that she joined Tanya working in the K-Road parlours and then met Stephen Stone. Her first day as a prostitute was September 10 and that threesome with Tanya and Stone would have been September the 17th. Add that all up, says Gail, and she simply can't have been in a position to commission a hit on Dean. Dean disappeared on August the 21st, but according to her timeline, she hadn't even met Stone by then. John Bradley agrees that there simply isn't time for the police version of events. I found the trade exchange where Gail advertised, and that brought us down to three days, three days for her to have met Stephen Stone, turn from just an ordinary mum to a drug-using prostitute with all this stuff going on. That's what I can never come to terms with, how, how that can be so overlooked. For now, let's consider the situation for Gail Maney in February 1998, six months after her arrest. Gail and her three co-accused have just sat through a depositions hearing into the murder of Dean Felicens, and a judge has agreed the prosecution have enough of a case to take it to the High Court. And Gail feels that with the help of John Bradley and her defence lawyers, she's got some pretty strong arguments ready for when the actual trial begins. Because I thought, this is not true. You know, people are going to see that this isn't true. There's no body, there's no DNA. I wasn't telling any lies, and my story has always been consistent throughout time. I don't have to think about what I said in my statements because it's the truth. But then something really strange happens. In April 1998, eight weeks after those depositions, and with the trial still months away, someone picks up the phone and calls the police. They have some information they want to share. They know something about a murder that happened back in 1989. They say the guy who did it was called Stephen Stone. But the caller's not talking about Dean Felicens. The caller says the victim was a woman, and her name was Leah. Next time on Gone Fishing, 
Senior Sergeant Burgess says there are people who are keeping quiet about Leah's disappearance from Queen Street three years ago. Leah, I remember Leah all right. She was murdered. Stone said, we've got to take the body out to the bush. Gone Fishing is a joint production from Stuff and RNZ, written, presented and produced by Amy Maas and me, Adam Dudding. Our executive producers are Tim Watkin and Justin Gregory for RNZ and Catherine Goldsworthy for Stuff. This episode was engineered by Rangi Poet. Visuals by Jason Dore. Thanks to Justin and Te Ara website for details about the life story of Don Buck. You can subscribe to the full eight-part series at Apple Podcasts, Spotify and other podcast providers. You can also go to the Stuff or RNZ homepages to listen or to find details on how to subscribe. <laughs>